name is Dwayne Haggerty and I'm President and CEO of Heritage Works. And today we are going to be presenting uh, uh, with the Unitarian uh, Universalist uh, Fellowship of Dubuque uh, some, a really interesting find related to uh, a ceiling that they uncovered when they were doing the restoration of their building. And today I have with me Marion Mache Heiner, who is the president of the UFD. I've been the, the president of the board for the Unitarian University Fellowship um, for three years, and we started the, the project in the first year when I started on the board, and it's just been such a tremendously exciting project for our congregation to be involved in. So why don't you explain a little bit about what the, what the restoration is involving here, what, what sorts of things you're doing to the building, and how that is going to impact your congregation. Sure. Um, the project actually is a total rehabilitation of the church building, the exterior and interior. And um, it started with someone noticing that at one time the church had a belfry on the, uh, the, the north side and just wondered what it would take to bring that belfry back, to reconstruct it. We loved the building. We bought it in 2004, and it felt like our spiritual home. Um, but we, we were living with a building that had some major issues, and so we're very grateful that um, a generous benefactor encouraged us to pursue this and encouraged us to um, do fundraising, to cover the costs of the, the rehabilitation. And we feel like we're going to have just a, a, a wonderful resources, not only for the congregation, but for the Jackson Park neighborhood and for the city of Dubuque. And what is the timeline on completing the, the restoration of this building? We're hoping that we will open the doors for the, the church in late summer or early fall. So one of the other things that was discovered in this restoration when the drop ceiling was removed is uh, we discovered this beautiful ceiling which is above us that um, was something that we weren't expecting to find at the time. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about on this video. But uh, why don't you give us some of your thoughts on uh, the, the discovery of the ceiling and what that means to the congregation, what you think that means to the community. Sure. Um... Yeah, it was a, a complete surprise with when they removed the drop ceiling. Well, you're the one who noticed that there was something underneath a layer of paint, and it turned out to be this gorgeous um, series of, of panels and a central rosette that we learned um, in consulting with um, Tony Cartsonis from Historic Surfaces in Detroit, Michigan. He has consulted with other projects, in the group, including Steeple Square, and his enthusiastic um, reaction to seeing the photos was that this is something really unique in consulting with, with Gary Stoppelman and Stacy Peterson from the Dubuque Museum of Art. We began to appreciate that this was a connection not only with the people who built the church, the German immigrants who built our, our building that we're being restored, that is being restored, but they hired skilled artists to add something of beauty in, in their simple, modest church. So there's there are a couple of connections with history. With the history of the Dubuque community with the German immigrants and the early artists who earned their living by doing church painting. So it's this interesting intersection, I think, of um, the history of Dubuque being renewed through the building and also through the restoration of the ceiling. Before we get into the details of the ceiling restoration, we'll give you a little bit of a historical background of the church. The church was constructed in 1885 as the German Methodist Episcopal Church. The architectural plans were taken from a Methodist architectural plan book that was used in the late 1800s, early 1900s to build Methodist churches throughout the country. The plan for the German Methodist Episcopal Church was plan number 28A in the catalog. You can see from the plans that the church was constructed very faithfully to the design as shown in the, um, the architectural plan. The area that we are talking about where the ceiling was found 
was noted as the lecture room on the floor plans. It is an area to the east of the main sanctuary of the church. Around the time of, of World War I, the German Methodist Church began to distance itself from its German identity due to the anti-German sentiment at the time. The congregation eventually affiliated itself with St. Luke's Methodist Church on Main Street. We believe that sometime in the 1960s, the belfry was removed, uh, most likely because of structural problems. And then there were some pretty substantial interior changes, specifically in the east area, uh, which was the lecture room. Um, that area was kind of uh, closed off and the ceiling was lowered. Um, there was um, a, a lowered ceiling and uh, bathrooms were constructed in that part of, of the church. The Gronin team is the construction manager on the project. When they started doing demolition on the interior, they discovered that the east wing had a false ceiling. When they removed the false ceiling, they discovered that there was a vaulted ceiling uh, above the false ceiling. Um, initially, Dwayne had noticed that there was some um, ghosting of uh, painting on the ceiling. And once the scaffolding was put up to start replastering everything, uh, Tim Olson and I got up and got up closer and we noticed there were, really was something there. We went in prepared to do a lot of um, careful uh, removal of paint and started that way, but it, it turned out we, that uh, we could just wash the, uh, the paint away. Uh, so we just kind of started with some spray bottles and, and water and like masking tape, anything just to kind of peel off some paint without damaging what was underneath. And luckily the water worked very well to just take the paint off. Um, and so we started with just kind of towards the middle where the rosette was. We had no idea what we were gonna find. Um, so it was really neat when we uncovered as much as what we did. And you know, what we discovered was uh, much more than a stencil. It was a, a Trump Loy painting with, uh, with shadows and, and uh, details and, and uh, uh, it was pretty amazing. I just want to talk a little bit about the process and what we're doing to try to preserve this original hand-painted ceiling decoration. And as you can see here, uh, what initially was discovered once they removed the drop ceiling is all this kind of dark tan beige paint. And then it was noticed that we could see the silhouette of some designs underneath it, which creates kind of what we call like a ghost. And so uh, the, the, the paint that was currently exposed seemed to be really soft and friable. So then an attempt were made to try to carefully remove it. And then the first step in the process was actually just with water, allowing it to saturate the paint and then clearing it. We were able to remove this paint, which clearly indicates that the, this paint is actually a water-based paint, probably a calcimine or a distemper. They were pretty common in the 19th century. They're made out of whiting hide glue and uh, water, and then you will put dry powder pigments in it to tint it. But we're very fortunate that it actually is a soft paint on top of an original harder paint, which appears to be an oil. But as you can see, even after removing it, a lot of residue still stays in place. So what we've been able to do is uh, put on a second application of another cleaning agent and what we've uh, you've been using is an emulsion based cleaner. Emulsions are where you mix uh, maybe solvent together with water and it's typically in a gel form and the added benefit of something like an emulsion, it can stay on the surface and it can you can have a little dwell time and it softens up all the little particulates that are left and some of the residue and so we're able to remove a lot of the little residue that's left but even still if you notice here this little bit of white hazing it still will require a final rinse to remove all of that and then so the process will be to remove all of this get it as clean as possible then we'll be able to assess the uh, conditions and other uh, rectifying work that we need to do 
with some things like uh, plaster delamination because we have some areas where if you notice these cracks, they're telling us that there's some problems with the plaster and that's very common for old buildings like this, especially plaster on wood lath. But then even beyond the plaster, as you can see, there still were a lot of losses in the original paint that maybe have to get dealt with and areas that are maybe uh, a, li a little less intense than others, as you can see in certain areas over there. So it's just making decisions about how many things we need to do after that point, not to completely reconstruct it, but to allow it where at least it's a cohesive looking ceiling. So we're just trying to figure all that out now and we're really excited about moving forward. So we should know a lot more after we've finished uncovering the rest of the ceiling. Once the entire ceiling was uncovered, we determined that it was a trompe l'oeil style painting uh, done in an Italian Renaissance revival style of interior decoration. The style uses classical motifs with flourishes from the Italian Renaissance. In this case, the ceiling has uh, a paneled coffered look with a very elaborate center rosette. Although the church was constructed in 1885, uh, the Italian Renaissance Revival style is more of a Gilded Age type of style of decoration, so we believe that the ceiling was painted most likely in the 1890s when the Classical Revival style was more common. I just want to talk a little bit about the trompe l'oeil technique. Trompe l'oeil is French for fool the eye. It's commonly referred to in painted decoration as something that uh, is trying to emulate an item that's in three dimension, but doing it obviously in a two dimensional way with paint. So if you notice, you have here this idea of a three dimensional plaster rosette, but it's clearly done by just painting it on the surface. Now, there are different ways of doing trompe l'oeil from kind of really basic with maybe only two to three colors to very complex. I say this is more on the complex side, uh, where if you notice, there is a lot of different variation in the values. So they're almost trying to literally paint something to render it or draft it to make it look like it's three dimensional because of all the different colors that are here. Because normally when you just try to do it in a simple way, it might have just a, a mid tone or base color. Then you just might have a highlight and a shadow. Whereas here we have a mid tone highlight shadow, but we also have variations of the mid-tone, variations of the highlight, and then also they even added accent colors in the way that you would polychrome deck, uh, polychrome items to add decoration. So this is really done on a high level. Now the other thing is when you would try to do trompe l'oeil in a very expedited way, sometimes you would do it as a stencil, whereas here this is all hand done, all hand painted, more time consuming. So what they probably did was transfer the design uh, using what's called a pounce. A pounce is a, a drawing that has little holes wherever the design is uh, with using a little needle. So the little perforations allow you then to, you put the, the paper up and then you use charcoal powder with a pounce bag. And when you press it, it'll leave the mark of wherever the design should be painted. And then they would hand paint it. Now, I want to talk about the trompe l'oeil border, though, where it's done in a slightly different way. It still is trying to 
uh, emulate the idea of something three-dimensional, but if you notice, it's really done to kind of uh, emulate the idea of a raised panel molding or frame. And the way that they would do this is actually by painting different color lines in the same way, like if you saw a molding that had different profiles, there's obviously points that would catch the light and have a highlight and areas that would recess in and have a shadow. And there again, using different colors, mid-tone colors, highlights, create this idea of a raised frame. But there again, this is not just ordinary stuff of just two colors where the shadow to the mid-tone, they've actually gradiated a little bit so it really feels like it's a curved surface and then the highlight is done uh, in a bright way to really kind of pronounce that that high point of it. So given that it's seen from, you know, 15 feet below, it really has that punch to feel like light is hitting that top edge of that surface. So once again, really well executed because obviously back in those days, I didn't have masking tape like we have now. So this is all hand done, hand lined and striped. and the most common method used back in those days was using a lining stick, which is a, basically a ruler with a reverse bevel, and then you literally paint against that straight edge, being very careful to apply even pressure so the line actually stays consistent, but also that you get no paint that floods underneath the lining stick as well. So that's kind of the process that they utilize in doing the trauma. We don't have any documentation about who painted the ceiling, but it is clear that whoever painted the ceiling had great artistic skill and likely someone who had training in an academic setting. In the 1890s, a couple painters come to mind. The first is Franz Simetz. Franz Simetz was a painter from Luxembourg who lived in Dubuque from 1891 to 1896. Before coming to the United States, Franz Simetz had his artistic training from the Munich Academy and the School of the Beaux-Arts in Paris, France. So, so Simetz had a pretty sophisticated artistic pedigree. He was known mostly for his portraits and his landscape paintings, and he was also known as being a decorative painter in Dubuque. One of his known commissions was at St. Mary's School at the corner of 15th and Jackson. He painted murals and ceiling paintings at the school, remnants of which are still located above drop ceilings. However, the character of this painting is different than what's found at the Unitarian Church. Another highly trained artist in Dubuque in the 1890s was Joseph Walter, who moved from Austria in 1897 and took up his home in Dubuque Joseph Walter received his art training at the Munich Academy and then subsequently at the Vienna Art Academy. Like Simetz, Joseph Walter was known as a portrait painter and also a landscape painter. However, Walter became well known for uh, painting hundreds of murals in churches throughout the Midwest, most of them Catholic churches. Remnants of his murals are found locally at Holy Ghost Church that had an extensive collection of murals until they were painted over in the 1960s. Walter also painted murals at St. Mary's Catholic Church, now known as Steeple Square. The most extensive collection of his murals is currently found at St. Peter and Paul Church in Petersburg. So after we uh, got the initial thing, uh, initial part of the ceiling cleaned off, um, we thought, okay, we got to do a deeper clean here. So um, luckily Tony showed us what to do and we used an emulsion cleaner and cleaned the ceiling. Just kind of brush it off first, you know, and you know, we wanted to do two things, remove the residue, but see what we can do about softening all these little remnants that are stuck in the little craters in the paint. But it doesn't seem like it's getting it all out, but it's, doing it, it's getting some of it out. And what I had was like, one, it could even be some of the wet rags, like that have been kind of rinsed and cleaned from the day before. And then it works well just to get rid of the, the main 
of the main uh, emulsion that's on the surface. You just want to, and then maybe just keeping a small bucket that, in the same way you were rinsing with kind of a dirty water just to kind of keep this one a little fresh. Um, so an emulsion cleaner um, is basically just like a hand cleaner, um, is what Tony used, but um, it just breaks down any sort of extra residue that's sitting on the surface without damaging the paint. Um, so it gets kind of like the grease and the dirt and the grime off of the surface. So um, we just kind of went over that with a little bit of water, brushed it, and was able to sponge wipe and with clean cloths cleaned off the ceiling. So. Um, it looked a lot better after we got it cleaned up. So. so what we're doing here is we're actually extracting small paint chips. And the purpose of this is actually to be able to examine them under the microscope so that we can determine how many layers may potentially be underneath <coughs> this current decorative scheme. The other helpful thing is it allows us to do better color matching uh, of the current scheme as well. So it tells us things like how strong the color was, how many layers, was there something like a varnish or glaze on top of it. So it's kind of really helpful to, to gain a complete understanding of how the, all the original finish is, but also what, or what could have been there historically even before it, uh, this current scheme. Hi, we're here looking at the ceiling once uh, all the final removal of the calcimine paint layer has been done and we can see that all the original decoration has been completely exposed. And the next step in the process is where we have to now put on a surface coating, which is called Acryloid B72. It's a special consolidant to use in conservation. And it does three things. Number one, it serves as a protective layer on top of the original paint surface. Number two, it kind of slows down the aging process of all this old paint now that it's become exposed again to just air and oxygen. And number three, it resaturates the colors. As you can see here, we're on this rosette. We've only done the half of it with this consolidant. And you can see that the colors are a little brighter, a little more punchy because what it's, it's a, it works in the same way that using a varnish on any other type of surface would do. After we've applied this uh, consolidant layer, which we call an isolating layer, we will then go through and find any plaster that is unstable and we will try to re-secure it. As you look around, there are a few losses in the plaster, uh, like in the corner over there, and then stress fractures are usually an indicator of some type of, type of movement uh, in the old plaster support. Uh, this plaster was done originally on wood lath, as you can see in the opening over there. And it's a little thin, thinner than what would have been the norm historically, which maybe explains why there were so many uh, cracks through the plaster. It's not too bad, but we still wanna go through the motions to stabilize whatever plaster is loose. And it's a two-step process where we will inject an acrylic resin dispersion, and we, and we do that in cracks and the voids. And what that does is it helps minimize the movement between two areas or two planes of plaster. It's also used that if we have a, a certain layer of the plaster that's just pulling away or delaminating from other portions of the plaster, it kind of helps to reattach it so we don't lose that skim coat layer uh, of it. And then the other method where the plaster is really unstable, we'll use mechanical fasteners, which are called plaster, like plaster washers, which will help re-secure the plaster to the rafters uh, in uh, the ceiling behind the plaster using screws as well. So then it's secured to something that's very steady being the wood. So that's our next step in the process. And we're gonna stop at that point with uh, the conservation treatments until uh, a full plan can be worked out for how to uh, finish all the treatments and restoration of the rest of the ceiling.
what I'm working on now is trying to stabilize the plaster on the historic ceiling. Since the idea is that we're trying to conserve as much of the original decoration as possible, we don't want to rip out unstable plaster and repair it as you would as an ordinary method of plaster repair. So we're doing what's plaster stabilization. It's a two-part system where we do injections with an acrylic resin dispersion called Roplex, but then we also do mechanical fasteners. So the first step in the process is to kind of identify all the areas that are loose and we kind of sound test it. And usually cracks are a good indicator where there's some instability in the plaster. Then I'll drill small holes uh, to be able to open a, the cavity to be able to inject the resin. And then we start with a pre-wet solution, which is the resin together with water and alcohol. And what that does is the alcohol and water allows it to kind of absorb into the loose powdery plaster. And it creates the void for the regular resin to come in. So what you'll do is you'll actually just take a syringe, find your hole, and then you'll know if it's accepting it by pressing down and you see nothing squirting back at me which means the void is large enough to take the resin. And then you see all the thing, all of the pre-wet I, I pumped in there, it didn't bounce back or uh, flow back out. So that means I found a good location where the, it's taking the resin. I'll let that set up overnight before I follow back up with the same pr procedure, but with the straight resin. Now, in the areas where we have to do mechanical stabilization what we'll do is we'll use regular resin which is a little thicker because of not having water and alcohol and then we'll inject it in an area that if you've noticed I've pre-sunk this area to be able to accept the plaster washer, uh, which means I've carved into the plaster a little bit so it can countersink. And then using the resin, we just pump some in there carefully. Some might flow back out, but that's okay. But you can see it's actually accepting it. can see it's just staying there but it's not dripping down which means the cavity is big enough but I'm not putting a lot in there then I'll take a screw with a plaster washer and a plaster washer is actually just a standard washer but it has perforated little holes in it and the idea behind the holes is it allows it to be flexible and the reason we need it to be flexible is we don't want to press too much pressure like you would an ordinary, with ordinary screwing of elements or washers because then we're going to just crush the plaster that's underneath it. So what I'll do is I'll take this and I'll slow it down as I'm getting close and you see how it's just it's flexing with the contour of the plaster and you can see now it's bent the washer and that's where the hose helps out where it's applying enough pressure but not so much that we're just destroying the plaster so it's pulling then this area in tight which hopefully means that we've made it stable so now that we've put the washer in and we also have all these little holes throughout the ceiling We'll go back in uh, when we do the full treatment of the ceiling to preserve and restore it. And we'll do tiny little fills for the small holes and then we'll patch over this as well. So, and then we'll in paint everything to match the surrounding areas. We won't probably deal with a lot of the cracks because it's just an inherent part of the, the ceiling. And it typically, when you get into patching cracks, if we're saving all the original paint around it, you almost notice the touch-ups more than the actual crack itself. 
so typically, but unfortunately, we have to make this large enough to countersink the washer. Otherwise, the washer will just be exposed on the surface and it's just a bit of an eyesore. Um, so it was really neat to uncover something that's been covered for so many years because it's kind of like being an archaeologist in a way. Um, and it's kind of interesting because I always think, why would anyone ever cover that up? But we're still doing the same thing today. Maybe not as preservationists, but um, there's a lot of things that people take for granted and they just paint over it because they think it's old. But it's kind of interesting because sometime down the road, someone else is going to probably find that. And they're going to think, why did they paint over this? People have been doing it for years. So when we find something like this, it's probably not something that was special um, when it was painted over. It just has gotten old and boring, I guess. But finding it again, it just makes it new again. Um, so to be able to find it in, in the condition that it's in and be able to restore it, it just kind of tells the story that, you know, it's been here all this time. It's just, it has been hidden. So um, to be able to find it and preserve it and restore it, um, it just brings more life back into the building again. So this is a, a different project that I've never done before. Um, I've never seen anything like this, and this is all very new to me. So to be able to work with Tony, who's an expert in the field, and show us how to do this sort of thing, um, it brings a whole new appreciation for, for this art form that I didn't know existed. Um, and which, if I didn't know it existed, and I'm very passionate about preservation, I'm sure there's a lot of people that had no idea this existed. Um, so to be able to, yeah, to be able to preserve something like this, um, it's a treasure, really. You know, I'm really excited about learning these things. Both, I, you know, I've considered using stenciling in, uh, uh, in our house. Um, you know, just it, learning all these new things that it, you, you realize what's possible. And I, through stained glass, I've uh, gotten ideas to, uh, um, you know, to make my own stained glass windows kind of based on that Gothic style. And, uh, you know, I, I make frames for my uh, paintings, so all the work I've done at, um, uh, doing a, um, a full graining and that kind of thing, it's you realize how you can use that in artwork for different, different effects. Mostly it's made me uh, look at uh, art and architecture in a different way. You see what, what artists did in the past, which I things I didn't even realize were possible with the like the Trump Loy painting and uh, and stenciling and and it's just opened up a lot of new things for me. So moving forward in the <clears throat> hopefully the restoration phase of of this painting, what do you hope to to learn and gain from helping Tony with that process? Right. Well, so the so the idea with helping Tony is that I would be uh, an assistant and maybe doing some of the uh, um, the simpler things. But I think you know, in the past, watching him work, I've I've uh, learned uh, um, uh, some of his techniques. So just watching and maybe doing some of the simple things, I've. Uh, I'm hoping I could do uh, possibly a kind of a simple Trump Lloyd design, or at least I would see how it's done, whether I want to do that, um, you know, that's something, that's something else, but at least I would learn how it's done. What I find really gratifying is knowing that we are, we're providing an opportunity for current artists, especially Tim Olson and Adam Schwendinger, um, they are learning about historic preservation techniques and painting techniques that will continue that le legacy of, of art in the Dubuque community. They now will have valuable skills that they can apply to other historic preservation projects, and Tim is going to incorporate some of the skills he's learning in his artwork. So this is, there's this wonderful intersection of um, German immigrants and the art community that is going to live on in this building. So this is a wonderful connection of the past to the present and yes. making your building relevant to 
um, you know, the past relevant to the users of today. Um, I think that's what's such a, a wonderful part of, of this restoration process. So what do you think that uh, will be the impact? Uh, you, you talk about some of the impacts to to your congregation, but what do you think the impact will be to the surrounding neighborhood that this project will have on the neighborhood? I think it's been a tremendous investment in the neighborhood. There are many properties that need to be um, restored and, and rehabilitated. And I think the fact that we're investing $2 million in this, and it's not all of our own money. We have many wonderful partners. And actually this little corner with the, with the ne next door property and then the Lacey Mansion, another neighbor that is investing in restoring that beautiful property. Yeah. So um, I guess what I would like to say is that, you know, from Heritage Works perspective, you know, it's a joy for us to, you know, to work on this project because there are so many aspects that really do involve your restoration and preservation and uh, we're thankful to your congregation for giving us the opportunity to help you with that to make this a really um, not only beautiful project but impactful for for your congregation and for the community well, and i think that brings to mind that we we would never have embarked on this journey if it hadn't been for heritage works and our other partners, Ronan Restoration, Stickley Morton Architects, um, our benefactor. It has been just such a rewarding collaboration. Um, so positive, everyone giving us encouragement and support, and we would never have been able to do it alone. We would never have even imagined right. that we could take this on on our, on our own. So thanks to Heritage Works for all the help that you've given us in finding grants, in um, putting together our fundraising materials. This was all a new venture for us. We had no idea that we would be able to do anything like this. Sure, well thank you for that, appreciate yes. that. Now that the ceiling has been uh, conserved and stabilized, the next step is to restore the painting to some of its original um, condition. And in order to do that, we will have Tony Cartsonis come back uh, to do the, the paint restoration. And that's a pretty meticulous process because it involves infilling uh, lost areas of paint. It involves um, infilling the areas of plaster that were repaired. And as Tony mentioned, the little areas where he had the uh, plaster anchors will also be repaired. So the cost of that is approximately $25,000 to have Tony back to finish the restoration of the ceiling. So uh, that was, as was mentioned, a, um, an item that was not included in the original budget for the, the restoration. And so the congregation is currently uh, raising funds to, to pay for that restoration. So if you have any ability to help uh, with, that, um, with that fundraising activity, um, certainly feel free to reach out to Heritage Works or reach out to uh, UUFD. And um, I'm sure they would be, they would love to, to have your support. And of course, we thank you all for participating in this, um, in this presentation. Uh, thank you also specifically to uh, the city of Dubuque who pro helped provide funding uh, for this program and also helped provide funding to bring Tony Cartsonis here to do some of the planning for the restoration of the ceiling. Thank you to Uni uh, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Dubuque. Uh, for doing this project and for giving us access to their building. Uh, thank you to Kate Tully for, uh, for sponsoring the event. Um, thank you also to Gronin for, um, for your help in the, uh, the, the restoration of this beautiful building. Um, thank you to everyone that, that was involved in this project. Uh, we will be having a video once the ceiling is restored. We'll have a similar video to go through some of the uh, some of the details of the restoration of the ceiling, how that was accomplished, so that you can see the final result. So um, I hope everyone enjoys their summer, and we'll be back to you um, in the fall with more videos. In the meantime, Heritage Works will have some in-person tours. Um, the first one will be um, uh, at the, the um, Langworthy neighborhood on July 20th. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all there. Check our Facebook page for more information on that.